Ooh, tell me how everything's looking from over there. Make sure the audio's working good. All right, we are live. Welcome everybody. I think we are ready to get started in a couple of minutes here. We just dropped down to. Hey, Steve. Thanks for showing up two weeks in a row. John, thank you for staying up for the show. How late were you up last night imaging, Steve? <laughs> right. Thanks, Alex. I'm going to make a quick Facebook post just so people know mm -hmm. we're live. Sounds good. Right. All right, one more minute and we will jump right into the show. Hey, welcome in, Jeff. All right, I think we are going to go ahead and jump in.
All right, so everybody, welcome to the second episode of The Glass Room. Uh, we are very proud of that pun, and we are going to keep using it. And this is going to be an ongoing series, since we love doing it so much last week. Uh, we just want to keep this going, so we want to have a little bit of a focus each week. So this week, we're going to talk a little bit about Hubble, as uh, the Hubble Space Telescope celebrated 30 years of operation this month. So we're going to touch on that a little bit later. We're also going to be talking about the Starlink satellites, which have made a little bit of a, a little, you know, jump in the news recently. So we'll be talking a little bit about those. But as we're going to start with, with all of our shows, we want to make sure that anybody that's tuning in for the first time, we want to be able to kind of reiterate how to find your way, way around the, uh, the entire night sky, uh, no matter where you are. So we're going to start by using this program called Stellarium. So the great thing about Stellarium is it's a free planetarium software. So if you want to just go and look around and see where everything is in the night sky, you can download it for free. And if you don't have a computer that has a hard drive, uh, so you're stuck with just a Chromebook or your computer's just way too darn full, there's also an online version. Uh, so you can go through and explore where everything is in the night sky. Uh, here, I'm just going to show you guys some quick tips on how to uh, not only kind of find your directions, but also some key things to look for and pick out when you're outside at night. So to start, uh, if you guys all look kind of above us, you can see we're looking towards the south because the, one of the nice things about Stellarium is you have these wonderful colored cardinal directions. However, when you go outside, uh, you won't have big uh, orangish red letters on the horizon. So we are going to uh, take those off and we're going to learn how to figure this out for yourself. So one thing I'm also going to do is we're just going to leave some of the brighter stars labeled and right now this is what the sky looks like from Yerkes Observatory because one of the cool things about Stellarium is that Yerkes is actually in here as a location. So you can see our location is Yerkes Observatory. Now as we look around, there's always one specific pattern in the sky that I think everybody should go out and look for first. And as we're looking around, uh, since I've done this quite a few times, I kind of know where to look and how to find it. and if we zoom in a little bit, hopefully a very familiar pattern will start to stick out. So here we have the Big Dipper. Now you can ignore those extra lines coming off the end for just a little bit because we just want to talk about the Dipper itself. So the Big Dipper is one of the best things to find because six of those seven stars that make up the Dipper are actually fairly bright stars, and it makes it a very recognizable and easy pattern to find in the night sky. Unfortunately, tonight, uh, from the one last I looked out, there's really only patches of in the clouds, so not the best night to go out, but it does look like we're supposed to have better weather, better weather coming in the future, so that'll hopefully give us some opportunities for you to go outside and try this out. So the Big Dipper is great, not only because it's easy to find, but because it's always up in the night sky. And we will touch on that a little bit in the future. For now, I want to show you one of the best things that you can use the Big Dipper for. So when you find the Big Dipper, what you want to do is you want to look at the end of the cup at Mirac and Dubé. So here we have all seven of these stars. You have the three in the handle, and then you go off to the side of the cup, away from the handle, use Mirac and Dubé. And if you connect them in a line like you see them there, you can draw that line down until you hit another bright star. And now I say bright as it's uh, relative to this, most of the stars around it. Uh, in reality, this star Polaris is not that bright of a star. It's only about the 47th brightest star in our sky. Uh, so if you go out and you try to look for Polaris at first, it might be kind of tricky. Now, if you don't know the name Polaris, you probably know it much better as the North Star. And the North Star, or Polaris, stays in that exact spot for the entire night, 
and you can always count on it being right there. So a lot of people tend to think if you go outside and you look for the brightest star, that is the North Star and you can just follow that and know exactly where you're facing. In reality, if you go out and you look for the brightest star in the night sky, you're most likely going to end up facing south and be quite literally turned around. And then you will have uh, no luck trying to find anything in the sky. So if you find the Big Dipper first, and then look for uh, Polaris using the two stars on the end of the Dipper, that makes it a lot easier to find exactly where North is. Now, one thing I have to mention is that the Big Dipper is actually not a constellation itself. The Big Dipper is actually what's called an asterism, meaning it's only part of a larger constellation that looks like something completely different. So in reality, when we look up there and we see a big spoon in the sky, what really it is is the kind of the body and tail of Ursa Major, or the Big Bear. And of course, it only makes sense that if uh, the Big Dipper is part of the Big Bear, the Little Dipper then is a Little Bear, or Ursa Minor. Now with the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper, uh, you guys might notice that these two bears kind of have uh, oddly long tails. And it has to go back to the story about how they got up into the night sky. Uh, so these two bears were actually thrown into the night sky by the Greek god Zeus, who grabbed them by the tail and swung them around. And he swung them so quickly and threw them so hard that their tails stretched out and they remained stretched out uh, as they got stuck up in the night sky and have remained there ever since. So these are two of the main constellations to look for in the northern part of the sky. Now one other constellation that is really useful to find is will be a bit lower in the sky tonight and is the constellation Cassiopeia. So zooming out a little bit you can see Cassiopeia is very low on the horizon tonight. Uh, so if you have a bunch of trees to the north of you in your backyard, you might have a little bit of trouble picking Cassiopeia out. But the reason I want to bring up Cassiopeia is because it's also a very useful tool if you are having trouble finding the Big Dipper. So one thing I mentioned earlier is that the Big Dipper is always up in the night sky, but it's not always in the same position of the night sky. Uh, Polaris, or the North Star, always stays in that exact same spot. So you can always count on finding it there. But the Big Dipper does change its position a little bit. And if you see, we go back up to Polaris to turn that one on and turn the Big Dipper on. You can see that where the center of where the handle meets the cup of the Big Dipper relative to Polaris and the center of Cassiopeia, they're on the opposite sides of each other. Now, over the course of one night, the Big Dipper will move. But really what's happening is just the Earth is spinning. So where we're looking in the night sky, since we're moving with Earth, is going to be changing. So really the Big Dipper and all those stars that make it up are really stationary relative to us. But because we're spinning, they appear to move in the night sky. So one thing I'm going to do is turn the atmosphere off because we're going to fast forward uh, one full day. And you can watch how the positions of Cassiopeia and the Big Dipper stay uh, relative to each other, the same distance from Polaris, and Polaris appears to stay, stay in the same position. So as we get a little faster here, and you can see down at the bottom of the screen, unless that's kind of hard to read because the text is small, you can watch time go forward as we're now at 2 a.m. And so the two cups always kind of look like one is pouring into the other. So that's also another trick to help you remember uh, which direction to go if you found one and not the other. So let's say the sun didn't exist and we didn't have to worry about sunlight being up in the sky and uh, scattering and blocking out all the stars during the day. You'd be able to go out at 8 a.m. and you'd be able to see that the Big Dipper is now very low in the sky but it means Cassiopeia is very high up in the sky. So no matter what, you'll always have 
uh, those two constellations to look for in the northern part of the sky. So now we're going to go back and get back all the way until we're about 11.15. Send the sun back down the horizon. Now we can turn atmosphere back on. Oh, it wasn't quite night yet. too quick. Oh. All right. So now we are pretty close. And I want to talk about one other thing when it comes to kind of the motion of the night sky. So as we saw, everything kind of appeared to rotate around Polaris, and Polaris stayed in the same spot. But for the rest of the night sky, it doesn't quite work out that way. And astronomers have a way of mapping out the night sky. And it's, we do this using what's called right ascension and declination. And the best way to think about this is kind of like latitude and longitude, but for the sky. So if you kind of imagine a light bulb shining outward uh, toward a kind of light bulb inside of Earth shining outward, projecting these lines in the sky as if they were latitude and longitude on a globe, but we're kind of looking out at them. As you can see, as we move forward in time, Laris actually is making a small circle because it's not perfectly at the center of the North Pole. But from, our, from uh, what we can see, it basically stays in the exact same spot because it moves so slowly and is such a small circle, it's kind of hard to notice. So here we have these three, and you can see that they are uh, kind of make, they make a full circle. And anything that you, where you can see that would be in one of those circles where you can see all of it, where none of the circle dips below the horizon, is in what's called the circumpolar region, meaning that all of that stuff never actually sets. Meanwhile, if you go look to the south, you can see how we've mapped out the entire night sky, and everything has its own permanent right ascension and declination, and you can go and pick them out. So looking at the star Altair, you can see its right ascension and declination up to the top left. And that's actually part of the constellation Aquila. Vega, also another good star to find. And since it's up, oh, not the one I want. Actually, we'll just put those back down. Once you start zooming in, the grid starts to get a little confusing. So this is kind of how we map out the night sky using right ascension and declination. That's kind of like latitude and longitude, but projected out onto the night sky instead of being on the surface of a globe or a sphere. Now we're gonna take this down because uh, Katya and I want to talk a little bit about something that was in the news fairly recently. So uh, if some of you may have saw some of the images online of those streaks of light through the sky and a bunch of kind of what almost look like stars moving through the sky uh, that we now know are the Starlink satellites. And so the Starlink satellites is a project through SpaceX and from one of the brainchilds of Elon Musk in order to provide uh, internet access, high-speed internet access to remote locations all around the world. And it's quite the ambitious project and has caused a bit of an issue because they reflect a lot of light. So while I bring up the picture, uh, Katya, will you like to tell them about, oh, sorry, I first need to introduce my wonderful co-host. So uh, we have with us, a professional astronomer, and don't let her tell you otherwise, uh, Katya Gosman, and uh, she will give a little bit info about her uh, background while I get some images ready. All right, uh, hello everyone. Uh, good to see everyone here this evening. Uh, as far as what Adam says, uh, thank you. <laughs> That's very kind of you. 
Um, I am actually, I'm a fourth year undergraduate at the University of Chicago currently. Um, I will be attending graduate school next year uh, to study astrophysics. Woohoo. Um, so yeah, and I've been working with GLASS ever since it started. Um, I've been like involved with your keys and all that for I think three years now. And it's been a lot of fun. So yeah, while Adam brings up uh, pictures of our Starlink satellites, I can tell you a little bit more about them. So as Adam was saying, um, indeed, they have the mission to provide internet access to all places of the world, woohoo. Um, but there are some problems noted, especially by astronomers. So because they are very reflective, and they also fly in pretty low Earth orbit, um, they can mess up a lot of astronomical imaging that takes place. And so you might think like, oh, that's not like a big deal, like you'll have like a few streaks in them or something. But if you have a telescope that is doing, for example, a sky survey or taking images continually from dawn to dusk, etc., you have a lot of exposures that have these long streaks going through them because uh, you have a moving object in it. And so all those streaks will ruin calibration images, just images in general, so you won't get scientific data necessary. Um, and so right now, SpaceX is currently trying to figure out how to make them less reflective or ways to combat this. Um, for example, uh, coding it in like paint that's not as reflective, or for example, deploying like a solar shade to go in front of them so they won't reflect as much light as another idea. Um, but so far, we're not exactly sure as to how best we're going to mitigate this to make it easy for astronomers to actually get their observations. Uh, especially because a lot of times the satellites themselves can just autonomously change their orbits. Um, and so it's really hard for astronomers to actually plan that out and take that into account when their observations. So I'm pretty sure that right now they're trying to work on actually getting more up to date and updated data to astronomers try to better coordinate their observations together. So uh, I'm just going to interject quick here. So I have up now an image that was actually given to us. And this was taken from the uh, uh, backyard of Yerkes Observatory by one of our board members and a former director of Yerkes, uh, Kyle Cudworth. And here you can see he took a 30 second exposure. So instead of looking like little dots, you can see the streaks of all of the different uh, Starlink satellites going through the sky. So when these Starlink satellites first went up, they were about um, on the magnitude scale of one, which is brighter than most stars in our night sky. Uh, now, as they actually get farther up into uh, their final altitude for their orbits, they'll be go much, much dimmer to what is uh, five, which is uh, a fairly dim star, but still visible. And the bigger problem with the big surveys is that with a bunch of them being in there at the early dawn and, or the early dusk and um, right before dawn is when they'll reflect a bunch of light and can kind of ruin the surveys and kind of spoil a bunch of the data as Katya was talking about. So now uh, talking a little bit about the satellites themselves. So here is what one of the Starlink satellites looks like. So these are, they're each about 500 pounds and there are currently 420 of them orbiting uh, around the world. And they're about, five, they're 500 pounds as I was saying, and they're about the size of a large kitchen table. So they're pretty small satellites relative to a lot of the other things that are up there. Uh, but one thing that I want to show you guys is I think a lot of people are 
kind of unaware of how many things are actually orbiting in our night sky. So uh, I set Stellarium to put a marker and the name of different satellites to go up. And as you can see, uh, if you start to look around our entire night sky, there are quite a, a lot of satellites. Uh, as of right now, there are over 2,000 active satellites. Now, the Starlink, for Starlink, they want to eventually have uh, 12,000 with the possibility of eventually having 42,000 of these small satellites up there. Uh, now, they're not permanent satellites, so they eventually come down and, or are, um, are kind of out of commission. Uh, so they will be kind of a, a process of replacing old ones that will go on continuously. And as Kati was talking about, they do have different ideas for making those dimmer. Uh, at, right now, though, in our sky, there aren't any star links that you can kind of pick out. There's no string. So what we're going to do, because unfortunately the Earth is a little bit in the way, we're going to take the atmosphere off and remove the ground. And now we can kind of peer through all of space without having to worry about the Earth getting in the way. So as we look down, you can start to see strings of satellites. And these strings are almost always Starlink satellites. As we go over here, another string of Starlink satellites. As we go over here, another string of Starlink satellites. Uh, now, for just a little bit of context, we have launched uh, over 9,000 total satellites since Sputnik first went up. So we've put a lot of stuff up there, but there's still only around just over 2,000 that are actually active and doing something at the moment. So there is still kind of a bunch of space debris up there. So if you have any other questions, uh, feel free to drop those into the chat and uh, Katya uh, will be monitoring for any questions so we can talk about um, Anything out there? No, actually, I already see a question. Yeah, we have one from Sean. Would you like to take it? Um, so Sean is asking, was this reflectivity something that was never considered when planning Starlink in the first place, or did they want them to be this bright? I don't think that their intention was to make them as bright as possible so that they would ruin astronomical imaging. Um, but at the same time, that's probably an oversight on their part, I'm guessing. Um, I, I guess they probably did not think that it would be as disruptive as astronomers currently say that it, it is for their observations. Um, a lot of telescopes actually, like some of the big ones that we have, have algorithms and stuff in place to take out like satellite images and streaks from their images and all that but um other telescopes have problems with that for example the upcoming uh, vera rubin telescope formerly known as lsst um will have some problems with trying to get all those starlink trails out of its images. So hopefully by the time that it actually comes online in the next three-ish years, um, we'll have figured out some sort of solution to their reflectivity problem. Adam, if you have anything else to add on that. Nope. Uh, I did see one quote about uh, Elon Musk kind of uh, saying something about uh, in hindsight, it's a pretty obvious flaw. So I think it was something that was considered, but I don't think it was something that they expected to kind of turn into the problem that it has. Mm -hmm. And yeah, as um, Kate, who is monitoring uh, also our chat is saying that really reflective ones, so like the first generation of satellites will eventually fall and like burn up in the orbit before telescopes like the Vera Rubin come on. 
Um, they were actually designed that way purposely. Um, there's currently um, a lot of problems that we're dealing with and it's getting worse is space junk. Uh, so a bunch of stuff orbiting in the sky that could just, you know, sit there while its orbit very, very slowly decays throughout the years that poses problems, um, not only to like other satellites, but also potentially to us. Um, and so Starlink actually is trying to avoid the problem of having space junk, especially since there's they plan to have like 40,000 of these at some point. Um, and so that's the reason why they actually are orbiting at a lower orbit than a lot of other satellites, is that they're meant to be there and then slowly decay and burn up very easily in the Earth's atmosphere so that they don't have like every single generation and like 40,000 unused decrepit satellites floating up in space. Yes. So we are now getting to the point where, uh, Kant, if you would like to get the observatory prepped, I think we are going to be yes. transitioning there very soon. Yep, sun's at negative 16.3 degrees. We are good to open the dome. All right. So the second portion of this show, uh, as you can probably guess by the title, will be the observing. And so to do that, we are using the Stone Edge Observatory, which is a small observatory in Sonoma, California. And the reason that we have you guys up, staying up so late is because the sun takes longer to set over in California as they are two hours behind us. So to kind of know what the sky looks like, uh, we'd have to kind of move the time back uh, from our sky two hours, or you could just change your location in Stellarium to be there. But before we do that, I wanted to uh, highlight one other satellite that is orbiting around the Earth, and it's one of the ones that we wanted to touch on a little bit, the Hubble Space Telescope, um, or HST. So obviously the Hubble Space Telescope uh, is probably one of the most uh, successful scientific missions in the history of mankind, and it has been collecting data now for over for uh, 30 years as of this month. So we want to talk a little bit about some of the cool milestones and we want to show some comparisons between the Stone Edge Observatory by imaging some of the same objects and showing you examples uh, from Hubble. So unfortunately Stellarium doesn't have any images of the Hubble Space Telescope so we will grab one of those and uh, bring that up in a little bit. Uh, the telescope is now open and ready for observing. Awesome. So we are going to transition now to the uh, Stone Edge Observatory. Right. Looks good. That works. All right. Patti, would you like to explain some of the basics of the Stone Edge Observatory? The, the, the what, what we're using or the telescope itself? I talked Which a little one? bit about the telescope itself, and I'm going to point us to our first object. Wonderful. OK. So yes, uh, Stone Edge Observatory is a tour in Sonoma, California. Uh, it is located in a vineyard, in someone's like private vineyard, which is really cool. And so it's a pretty good location in terms of there being relatively little light pollution and all that. Um, and so the telescope itself is a uh, 20 inch, it's a reflector, a uh, Richie Crit. At least I cannot pronounce that um, telescope that has a whole bunch of different filters in it. So we can very easily make nice color images using the telescope. Um, what we have here, uh, oh yeah, so what is on the screen right now, what Adam is doing. So this is an interface actually in Slack, which is a very popular messaging group organization communication app that many of you have probably used, especially now. 
And so someone wrote a command line type interface in order to actually talk with the telescope remotely and send it commands, uh, which is what Adam is doing right now. Uh, so it's called Itzamna. Uh, so that's like the little app that he's using here. And after you open the telescope, the basic commands that you use are find, backslash find, and then the name of your object. So he is currently finding M100. Um, and then now he is plotting it uh, to see when the object is in observable in the sky. So what is its altitude versus time? Um, and so that helps us see when should we make our observations. Uh, regularly, most of the time, astronomers want to observe an object when it is at its highest point in the sky. So when it's at the top of that curve that you see there. Um, and that's because the higher you look in the sky, the less atmosphere we have to look through. So if you look at something really close to the horizon, you're passing through a lot of layers of atmosphere and that causes turbulence and problems with the image itself. You don't get a very clear image. Things kind of look like they're like floating underwater or something. They're very fuzzy. Um, so the higher, the better, basically. And so from the chart, we can see the altitude of M100 is pretty close to the peak right now. So that's going to be really good. Um, and then Adam is now pinpointing the telescope. So it is actually moving to its target. Um, and pinpoint actually can take a little while because um, its Omna will actually take a 10 second exposure, what it like thinks that it, it gets to about right location and send it to a website program called astrometry.net. Um, which basically can use that image that it took and verify it against like a database basically and figure out the exact coordinates of where the telescope is pointing and correct that. So it can center every single object really nicely. Um, and so we use the, this on most deep space objects that aren't very bright. We don't use it on bright objects because taking like a very long, a very long, a 10 second exposure can be very detrimental to the camera. Um, for example, if you're imaging a really bright star or planet. Um, but for all the objects most that we're gonna look at, pinpointing is what we wanna do. And one of the first lessons you will learn about astronomy is that if you were not a patient person before getting into astronomy, uh, it mm -hmm. will force you into becoming one. Uh, as instruments take time and a lot of astronomy is kind of sitting and waiting. At least that's what a lot of data collection is. Yeah, with Stone Edge, um, <clears throat> so right now we're controlling the telescope through its Omna, which is great. And it lets the users do very nice live interactive viewing where you can like get feedback right away. So you can order commands, you can take an image, you can see what it looks like adjust as necessary. It's a very interactive personal process. Um, but Stone Edge also has a queuing system. So if you don't want to stay up all night to take your images and you just want to like go to bed, forget about it and get some images the next day, you can submit your observations to the queue, um, which is basically you tell it, I want to observe these acts. And depending on how the queue is set up and who has precedence that day um, and like other factors, like how high is the object, et cetera, when is it setting, um, it will go and through the night take images that are in the queue. And then the next day you wake up, you go to the server and you can download all those images. Easy, said and done. Um, but it is, I mean, personally, I find it a lot of fun to actually stay up and take all the pictures yourself and have a personal experience observing. All right, so uh, while we're still pinpointing, the reason we are going to M100, uh, so for anybody wondering what 
why uh, this object is called M100. It's an object in what's called the Messier catalog. And oh, there we go, successfully pointed. Uh, so Katya, would you want to take the first image for us? And so yes. um, the Messier story is kind of a funny one. So I would definitely recommend looking that up. And if we get uh, kind of stuck a little bit later for time, I'm more than happy to tell that one to fill time. So uh, this is just means it's part of the Messier catalog and it's the hundredth member of that catalog. And what this is, is actually a spiral galaxy. And it was significant to Hubble because uh, when the Hubble telescope first went up, there was actually an issue with it. There was a problem with the mirror. And so for the first two years of Hubble being in orbit, all of the images were fuzzy and did not look right. So they had to design a whole brand new camera called CoStar in order to vastly improve Hubble's capabilities and actually bring it into being the tool that it is now today. So they had to send astronauts up there and actually physically replace the instruments in the back of the telescope. So now we're going to take a little bit closer of a look and you can see just 10 seconds with our telescope here, you can get a beautiful image of this spiral galaxy. Now there's not quite that much detail that you can see, but you can definitely still see that there are spiral arms going around. Now, a lot of the images that you see are usually um, false colored images where they take multiple images of an object and stack them together and assign them colors. But because the camera we're using really only takes is for collecting data. It's not for kind of just collecting uh, all the different colors and making one color image right away. But you can block out certain types of light in order to then use those images to represent different colors in the visual spectrum. So some of you might be wondering how bad was the Hubble before they were able to fix it? And we have an example of this. Oh, is there a cloud in the way? I think I can see where oh. the galaxy is. Interesting. Okay, well, if you want to take another one. Yeah. I will another one. put up the picture I was talking about. Uploading. All right. So the image on the left was before the new planetary and uh, camera co-star, and the image on the right is after they installed that, and it was one of the first objects and images that they uh, were able to put together and send back down. So you can see that the mistake that was made the first time was actually quite a big mistake and really limited the camera and the telescope itself on what it could do. So by upgrading that and fixing the problem, you then were able to get a drastic change in these images. And you can see the difference between uh, the images that you get from Hubble and images from other telescopes, uh, especially much smaller telescopes here from Earth. Kind of comparing them isn't really fair, but that's kind of what we want to do is show you just how incredible the Hubble Space Telescope still is. All right, so Katya, would you like to talk a little bit about how the imaging works? How making kind of those colored yeah. images goes? Sure. Yeah, so um, what I'm currently doing is taking images in different filters. So different filters let in different wavelengths of light. And you, you can stack multiple filters on top of each other to create a color image by assigning each filter to like red, one filter to green, one filter to blue, and stacking them together and creating a composite image. Um, there's like a lot of other more complicated ways, but that's like the basics, I guess, of doing it. And so Stone Edge has a couple of different filters. Um, 
I guess. So the image, the image that I first took was a 10 second in the clear filter. It's just like clear. There's like nothing there. Um, and that's just to make sure that the object is centered, it's in view and everything is good with the camera and the pointing. Um, the other filters um, that I'm doing are, so there's broadband filters such as the GR and I bands. Um, these are filters formally from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey or SDSS, which is a survey down in, I think, New Mexico or Arizona, somewhere in the south southwest of America. Um, and so those can correspond very, very roughly to um, red, green, and blue, actually in the other order. So G. Um, so G band lets in a wavelength around like 400 to 500 nanometers. So that's a pretty short wavelength. So that's towards the bluer end of the spectrum while I band lets in longer wavelengths. So that's towards like the red or even the infrared. Um, and then there's other filters that are narrow band. So they're a lot, they're, they're like, well, wide band or wide narrow band filters are more narrow. Um, so they're the H alpha, which is what the next exposure is that I took that has nothing in it. Sadly. Yeah, I think, uh, um, as Jeff put it in the comments, we're looking through uh, M0 for the <laughs> overcast <laughs> nebula. So. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. It is also very high humidity today. Yes, so some of the images were not going to come off that well. Uh, Katya, would you like to point the telescope to the area of the yes. sky in Ursa Major, please? Ah, uh, yes, that area. <laughs> let me, let me, yes. Um, let me see if I can do that. And I will, okay, sure, I'll let you uh, tell this story, but I'll set it up for you. Sounds good? Okay. Yeah, um, sounds good. So in the 90s, the Hubble telescope was actually not really seen as, as a success at first. Uh, one of the big blunder with the mirror was uh, a big misstep, and the project was super expensive, and there was a lot of excitement around it. So when the first two years, it wasn't really able to send us back anything uh, exceptional. Um, we, the people then were a little bit disappointed. And at the time, uh, they were looking for new interesting things to do with the Hubble Space Telescope. And uh, one of the things that the director of the Space Telescope Institute got was a certain amount of time that they got to dedicate uh, for the telescope to do whatever they wanted. And it ended up being uh, something very, very cool, and we want to demonstrate uh, something using the uh, Stone Edge Observatory first. It is pinpointing. Right, so we're going to be moving there. And so what we're moving towards is where this image was taken. And we'll take kind of a longer exposure, just for fun. And I will let Katya actually, if you'd like to dive into uh, the story, please be my guest. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, one day, the uh, so the director of Hubble always has discretionary time on the telescope, which means they, he or she can basically use it for whatever purposes they want. Um, and so one of these days, uh, the director of Hubble decided to point the telescope at absolutely nothing. <laughs> As in, um, he decided to point the telescope at a region of the sky that looked completely blank. Like there was nothing there, no stars, no galaxies. It just looked like a black void. 
Um, and everyone was like, this is absolutely horrible idea. Like, what are you doing? You're gonna lose your job if like this doesn't go well because bubble time is very expensive and uses a lot of resources. Um, people have to write many, many grants to get a lot of money to actually get bubble time. And so a lot of people were not okay with this idea and thought it was kind of dumb to point at nothing. But the director went and did it anyway. And actually, it was quite a good, good decision uh, because what came back is uh, what we now call the Hubble Deep Field. Um, and so, yeah. I have uh, an image that I will put in after we take ours. Okay, I was just about to ask. <laughs> yep, I have it ready. Wonderful. Um, once a telescope actually pinpoints. And so this image was quite spectacular and basically revolutionized our idea and concept of actually like how big the universe was in general and just how many galaxies exist. And so you'll see what I mean once we actually look at the image. Actually, we'll just do it. Yeah. All right. Oh. There we go. Yeah. So that is the original Hubble Deep Field image. Um, it's actually not one image. It's uh, a bunch of separate exposures that were taken over like a consecutive number of days. Um, and so it was assembled into this mosaic here. And if, if you can believe it, almost all of the objects and points of light that you are seeing in this image are galaxies. There are very, very few stars. Um, the very few stars that I see are like any object that you see that has a little cross um, coming out of it, that would be a star because you can see like the diffraction coming from the mirror, the spikes, but everything else is a galaxy. And some of them are the youngest galaxies that we've found, or at least were found at the time, some of the most distant. This basically revolutionized like how we even saw it, like the early universe and just how many galaxies are out there in general, uh, which was really, really cool. And there was actually after that, Hubble took um, like an ultra deep field image as well and an extreme deep field. So there were more of these taken later on once people realized that pointing at nothing actually was pointing at quite a lot. Just for Ooh, reference, and... there are three over 3,000 galaxies in this image, and it is a very, very tiny section of our sky. Mm -hmm. And so the image we're going to be taking now is really just to illustrate how empty of a, spe of a piece of sky that he was looking at and why everybody said he was crazy. Yeah. Because normally when you're taking images, you want to have something interesting in frame. <laughs> yeah. And after you see this image, you can you will probably be able to tell why people thought the director of Hubble was kind of crazy trying to do this. Right. And oh, actually, while we're waiting for that cut, would you like to get uh, the uh, Comet Atlas queued up? Or actually, start yeah. pointing us there, and I will um, talk a little bit about this very bland, empty piece of sky. Yeah, I'm going to try to find it as an object, and if it doesn't work, I'm just going to find the Arian deck of it. Sounds good. So if you're looking at the image here, you can see that um, there's not much going on here. There are a couple stars in this frame, uh, but that's actually a little deceiving because the field of view of the Hubble Space Telescope is about one twelfth the field of view 
of the image you're looking at. So really, the Hubble is only really looking at a small square in the middle and not looking at this entire field of view. So there weren't even this many stars in that image that he took. And this is why they thought that he was crazy because uh, taking an image of nothing is a little crazy. We are just very lucky that he decided to do something crazy and it ended up being uh, one of the biggest breakthroughs and one of the most successful images uh, ever taken. And sometimes it's kind of fun how you can actually go scroll through these images and if you download any of the Hubble deep fields, you can get the really high resolution ones and really zoom in and see all of the different uh, sizes and shapes of the galaxies that are kind of strewn throughout our universe. Oh man. Any um, luck, Katya? Oh, yeah, wow. there's a whole there's a whole bunch of them. I just need to pick the right one. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the Let's top just put one. it that way. Um, that's a visual magnitude of 3.63. Oh, that's a 20 uh, that altitude no. is 2.5. So it's right. it's one of the C-2019. It's supposed to be C-2019 Y4. Uh Oh, there it is, number 30. Like 30. Yeah, I don't know why there's A, B, C, D, but I can, let me get plotting 30. Aha. Yeah, it's, it's sometimes a little difficult to, we can get it just, it's just at the right altitude. Um, Doesn't the black mean you can't point there? Oh. E yeah why why does it say that interesting yeah it has to be in the blue okay sad i am You're right. so when we're looking um at these plots um, you can see like shaded regions that are black and gray and in previous images there were some regions that were like light blue and stuff. Those regions tell us when we can actually point the telescope at the object um, because there's a few like regions and parts of the sky that we can't look at. For example, uh, we cannot point the telescope any lower than 30 degrees in altitude. It's just not good. It's not good for the balance of the telescope, etc. Um, so we can't really look at anything close to the horizon. Also, I think the dome would probably get in the way of that. Um, so currently, when we're looking at the uh, viewfinder for Comet Atlas, it shows a black region, which does not indicate you can actually see the object, sadly. Uh, it has to be like light blue. Or it has to be like a combination of the blue and the gray to actually look at it unfortunately yeah darn but can i try one okay that's yeah okay matter. that's the same okay. thing well let's find one that's more strange. object to go to then uh, so one of the reasons that we wanted to go to Comet Atlas is because a lot of really cool research that's done with Hubble has been from images taken of things in our solar system, which not many people would think would be one of the main uses of a space telescope. Uh, but a lot of images of like uh, different moons around like Jupiter and Saturn, uh, Plut the first, some of the first images, really good images of Pluto were taken through uh, the Hubble Space Telescope and some really cool uh, images of certain comets and asteroids were also imaged through Hubble. But, oh, um, also, Adam, yes. um, hold on. I'm getting, I'm getting a message that we might actually be able to point to it um, because there might not be something that hasn't been implemented yet in its Omna. So I just need to check the hour angle of this object. Oh, do you need the hour? Uh, it's six see? hours, 11 minutes. 
Did you mean our angle? So um, Amanda, who has worked on Stone Edge and it's on the for a very long time is telling me that if it's between negative 80 and 80, you can go there. Between negative 80 and for our angle? Or for- Yeah, for our angle, apparently. That plus 59. Yeah, our angle. Um. Okay, we have we're Amanda good then. Jump in yeah, and... 59, 50, no, 59, yeah, 59 should be good. Uh, we can go there. Okay. And we should go there. Yeah, wait, <laughs> hold on. Soon. Oh, that's because I'm looking at Earth. Yeah, we can go there because it's also setting uh, down to the point where it's... Oh, you just don't yeah, have altitude, the blue shading for Yeah, altitude of... Okay. Yeah, exactly. Altitude is 31 right now, so we can totally go there. Um, we're good. Okay, so let me point this to 30. Ooh. Let's see what happens. We have a great question. Third. Okay, so one of the questions we got, Katya, was how long is the Hubble telescope supposed to be around? And are there plans to create a new Hubble or Hubble-like telescope? Uh, one of the space telescopes that's coming up uh, is... Um, Never mind, I guess we can't point there. Oh, does it say? Uh, it says, over the pole, impossible. <laughs> okay. Um, Good to know. All right, so let's find a planetary nebula that will be good. Just so we get one more good object. So I'm looking through, ooh, also M3 might be really good. Nice oh, globular yes. cluster. Uh, yes, let's, let's go get M3. Would you like to take us there? Yes. M3 sounds good. All right, so this will be the last object for the night. Uh, and, oh, back to... Oh, Cat's Eye would have been a good choice, too. I could go to Cat's Eye. I haven't moved anywhere yet. Oh, take your pick. What do people want? Yeah, uh, next comment gets the decision. M3 or the Cat's Eye Nebula? Yeah. We can talk about both three when we go there. Also, Sean has a question. Uh, when you remote view using a telescope, is it done by putting in coordinates or the object's name? And uh, the answer is both. So for objects that have names or in catalogs, such as the Messier objects or uh, members of the new general catalog or the NGC, um, in that case, then you can just input the name and it's Amna should usually just find it for you. Um, if you have something like the Hubble Deep Field, that's not programmed into Insomna. And so I had to manually input the right ascension and declination, which are like your coordinates in the sky. So it depends what you're trying to look at. And it also depends like telescope per telescope. And the hour angle actually is six hours, which is 90 degrees, which was not between negative 80 and 80, which is why it couldn't go there. Bad. All right. Well, let's. Uh, but it's okay. Nobody has rushed to. Okay. Well, oh, Jeff, you know Jeff just said M3. <laughs> of course. 
<laughs> Arcturus is always a very good alignment star. Oh yes, very easy to see. Or wait, but then wait, hold up. Before that, cat's eye either works. M three. Okay, Elizabeth says M three. Jeff says M three. We're going for M three. M three it is. Sounds good. I've already plotted it. So now all we have to do is oh, I already typed the command in. Pinpoint. <laughs> Perfect. Woohoo. Yes, everyone likes everyone globs. Everyone does like globs. And if you don't, we're gonna change your mind. Yes. Globs are some of the most spectacular things you can see. Oh, so one of the questions I didn't quite finish answering earlier. Uh, how long is the Hubble's telescope supposed to be around? I don't remember off the top of my head. Do you, Katya? I know it's no, not that I, much. I don't think it's supposed to be for very long anymore. Yes, it's approaching Sadly. the end of its lifetime. Yeah. There are new scopes that are hopefully going to be deployed at some point. Um, the JWST or the James Webb Space Telescope is a very much awaited telescope. Um, it keeps getting delayed in its launch. So I think it was supposed to launch like 2016 or something, maybe even earlier. And it just kept getting delayed and delayed. And now it's even more delayed. Um, I think it's two years out. All the pandemic stuff going on. Um, I remember being at a collaboration meeting and someone there works on JWST. This was back in like October, not October, November. And they were assuring everyone, they're like, it's going to launch on time this time. Like, don't worry, I assure you, it will all be good. <laughs> I guess not. Um, and so the cool thing about the JWST is it's gonna have a lot of capability in the infrared part of the spectrum. So taking images at wavelengths that are even longer than red. Um, which is going to be super, super cool and can look at things like actually like some of the first galaxies that ever formed. So we're all waiting for that. Uh, people are actually currently writing proposals for JWST. Um, a lot of proposals have to be written like months, years in advance. And so there's already some that have been submitted, accepted as like early proposals for when the telescope launches. It already has a whole bunch of objects to observe. So as I mentioned before, uh, part of be being in a, into astronomy is uh, just being patient. And <laughs> nothing is a better example than mm -hmm. the number of missions that have been postponed and been pushed back. But one thing that Amanda is mentioning in the comments is that the Hubble did outlive its expected lifetime by over 15 years. Uh, it was not expecting, they were not expecting to celebrate 30 years of imaging. So uh, so that's sometimes just a credit to how amazing these instruments are. Right. It's really incredible. And unfortunately, like none of the planned telescopes are going to be in the same wavelength range exactly as Hubble. A lot are trying to focus more on the infrared side, especially because infrared is really hard to get from ground-based observations. Um, so there won't be like a direct like successor of it, but it'll be close-ish enough with a lot more investigation into stuff that we haven't really looked a lot at much so far. Pointing. Katya, do you yeah, want to start introducing what globular clusters are? Sure. All right. So globular clusters are, as you might think from the name, globular or globes. So they're spheres, actually. They look flat when you look at them at like a picture or something, but they're actually three-dimensional. Um, and so they are very tightly gravitationally bound really dense clusters, yes, of really old stars. So like 
thirteens of billions year year old. Uh, for reference, the universe itself is postulated by astronomers to be something like thirteen point eight billion years old. Um, so they're super super old, and contain really old red stars. Oh, we got our first image. Amazing. And they are all tightly bound together gravitationally. Um, they're kind of opposites, you could say, of things called open clusters, um, which are a lot less dense. They're a lot, a lot sparser, uh, bright, bright and young uh, stars in these clusters, open clusters, that actually eventually, over many, many millennia, technically drift apart. So it's thought that our sun was actually at some point part of an open cluster, but drifted apart like most families do after millennia. Yeah. So yeah, so globular clusters are one of the coolest objects to look at. Just looking, just knowing that you're looking at something uh, so mm -hmm. ancient and somewhat mysterious. Right. There's also a lot of other cool things about globular clusters that we won't get into, but they can help map like the distribution of dark matter in the universe and in galaxies, which is really cool. But that's like a whole other thing. <laughs> That could be an entire episode in the future, so I will oh, be yeah. writing that down. Oh, yeah. And, okay. I took another one yeah. just for a little bit longer. Cool, oh, cool. And they usually will orbit, like, inside, like, in the core of the galaxy. All right. So, uh, unless anybody runs into the chat, uh, that was our last object for the night. Uh, if you have any other questions, feel free to send them to us. Uh, you can also tune in next Friday when we'll be having another episode with a different focus, which would be a great time to pitch that, but I have not made that decision yet. So we'll make sure that is posted mm -hmm. to Facebook as soon as we make up our minds. Uh, if you guys have any opinions or that you want to see some a topic covered, let us know by emailing us or contacting Glass some way, and we would love to look things up and try and do a show about it. All right, but with that, uh, we are going to, well, we're not calling it a night because this telescope is now <laughs> going to get used uh, by some of the students here. So we're all going to be jumping on a Zoom call and continuing our observing run. So we're going to hope the weather stays, stays good out there in California. But thank you guys all for tuning in. Uh, if you go uh, take a look at our Giving Tuesday campaign, this upcoming Tuesday is the hashtag Giving Tuesday Now, uh, kind of a time for all of us to come together and support uh, all of the nonprofits, especially given with what has been going on with the uh, worldwide pandemic. So please check that out and consider giving. Otherwise, thank you guys all for coming uh, and have a wonderful night. Yep, thank you everyone. Have a good night. <laughs>